Miss Merrill. Okay, we're gonna start. Uh, have you gotten going? Yep. Uh, roll off. Oh yeah. Well, we're gonna start our uh, meeting now. Uh, since most of our board members are here, we have to wait until there's a quorum to start our meetings. That's how my lots go. Um, so. Uh, First thing we do is, uh, well, welcome everybody. This is uh, Lines for Better District 6 is the uh, sponsor of this meeting, but we also work with other groups. Uh, so this is the Alexander Residents, the Alexander Tennis Association is one of the co-sponsors, uh, the North Market Business Association and the Tennis Association and Co Coalition of San Francisco is a, uh, also a co-sponsor as well as Tip Top Market who supplied the, uh, the drinks. So uh, welcome to our uh, February meeting of, uh, and uh, we refer to this as a stakeholder meeting because of the, the kinds of things we have on the, on the agenda. And uh, so the first thing we do is we go around the room. My name is Michael Nolte. Uh, I guess those people can't see. Okay. Uh, my name is Michael Nolte. I'm the, uh, uh, one of the co-founders of the Alliance for Better District 6, and I currently act as the uh, uh, executive director, and I'll be uh, one of the chairs of this meeting. Uh, so that is. Maybe I should move. Well, I'll say who he is. This is Marvis Phillips. He's the Indians of Joint Hostility. He's our land use chair and our public uh, public uh, public safety chair, and he's also for this year the parliamentarian. And we start over here on the. Uh, Far left. Over this way. Close oh, person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 My name is Jesus, I guess. And Michael Thomas mm -hmm. Gans, although I don't think he's asked it. Yeah, but both, everybody can speak out. So. And I'm yes. right here with Tenderloin Pride. Yeah, but who's your guy? That was like, and, and, okay. <laughs> I just, I give you an opportunity, everybody an opportunity to speak. Okay. Okay. Uh, and my name is Gerald Banks. I like to be called Aja. Uh, I'm part of the Tenderloin Pride and a part of the event we're putting it together, and also um, an at large member for the Alliance. Who are you? Your first introduction. Okay. Introduction, you mean? Yes, what's your name? I am Angelina Lero. I'm living here okay. in Alexander Residence in apartment 218. All right. Susan Bryan, I'm treasurer. I live in the neighborhood, and I, um, I'm also the uh, treasurer of Central City Democrats. Alliance for Better District. Alliance for Better District Six. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name's Shane Hart. I'm with the Redevelopment Agency. I'm Catherine Riley with um, OCII, former Redevelopment Agency. Okay, I'm David Lyle. I'm a uh, new board member here. Lieutenant Bill Conley from Southern Police Station. Uh, Lieutenant Henry from uh, Ten Lloyd Station. Okay. Um, I'm Jeanette Whitaker and I'm with the Um, Meryl? I'm in, I'm in here just, um, at, I'm an at large community organizer of the town. Um, Rock? And, uh, Dean? Uh, Dean Clark. Public nuisance is lazy right now at the moment. All right. Uh, all right. Welcome everybody, uh, including all the nuisances. Uh, so uh, the next thing we do is round rolls. Uh, we ask everybody to turn off pagers, cell phones, or electronic devices. Uh, this event will be videotaped. Uh, if you do not wish to be uh, videoed, stay behind the camera. No heckling or name calling. Create a safe environment in which every participant feels free to speak by reserving uh, any negativity. Speak responsibly and emphasize the positive. Do not interrupt another speaker and or engage inside. Uh, don't interrupt anybody uh, and, or distracted behaviors when others are speaking. Uh, this event is being sponsored by uh, nonprofit or organizations and so no political uh, campaigning is allowed inside the community. Here. If you have, want to do any political stuff, you have to take it outside. Um, then there will be uh, door prizes towards the end of the meeting. Um, everyone will be given two tickets. Uh, uh, if you decide to leave before your door uh, ticket.
tickets are announced, you can give your tickets to somebody else in the room, that is. And uh, for food, uh, there's no hoarding of food. Uh, wait until everybody's had some food before you go back for seconds. And the Alliance for River District 6 wants to thank our sponsors, which is uh, Tip Top Market, Dean Clark, and uh, other people that have donated the door prizes. Um, all right, we're going, now we're going on to uh, adoption agenda. So can I have a motion? To I have a motion to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Second. I see. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any no's? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Um, I'm four is um, the Alliance for Better District Six is a membership organization. Um, so that's what you put um, uh, is a membership organization, and there's two ways uh, uh, to we generate money. One is through our donation can, the other is through uh, people becoming members of our organization. And if people are interested in becoming a member, they can uh, fill out a membership form and pay membership dues for the year. Uh, okay, um, so then we move on to the next item, and that is. Uh, our guest speakers, our first guest speakers are from the uh, Mayor's Office of Infrastructure and Improvement, formerly known as the Redevelopment Agency. Uh, we, I don't know which ones they want to do first, so that's up to them. I don't know how you have free capital here. <laughs> so. Great, well thank you so much for inviting us. I'm Catherine Riley and Shane Hart. We're both from the Office of Community Investment and Infrastructure, which most people believe that say that's a former redevelopment agency. Well, we were invited tonight to talk about two of the projects we have within District 6. I work on Mission Bay, and Shane works on the Trans Bay project, so those are the two that we're going to discuss tonight. First, we just wanted to give you a little overview of who we are and how we got to where we are with our fancy new name. Um, am I standing here? Is it okay for everyone to see the presentation? Okay, great. Let me know if I walk in front of it, I'll move. Um, so OCII, we are technically the successor agency to the redevelopment agency. So since the 1940s, redevelopment um, agency is better well known. We've been working with Fillmore, uh, Trans Bay, um, Mission Bay, down in Harris Point Shipyard. That was the formula that we were known as before. Um, what happened though in 2011 is part of the budget process. Um, there's a whole process going through. If you want, we can tell you in more details. But the end game was all of the uh, redevelopment agencies in California were dissolved. So we are basically a successor agency. Our role now is to finish out the projects we were allowed to continue with. And then once we're done with those projects, we basically go away at that point. That said, is we got we have three projects which are um, long-term projects: Mission Bay, Trans Bay, and Shipyard. So those are the three ones we're doing most of our work with today. Um, these are redevelopment project areas. When redevelopment, we are no longer forming redevelopment areas. But at the time these projects were formed, they were created under state law. Um, basically, what you would do is you would identify an area that was considered blight, and there were legal um, legal definition of what blight was you draw a boundary around that and that would become a project area. As part of that project area, you'd identify your goals and objectives, what do you want to achieve in this area, and then the big key was by drawing that boundary and creating a redevelopment project area, you're allowed to access tax increment. What that is, is you've got your property taxes, so when you create a new project area, you do a study and you figure out, say you're collecting $100 per acre in property taxes. Those property taxes, a portion go to school district, a portion go to the state. They're broken out by state law and how you share those um, dollars. If you have a project, a, pro a redevelopment area, anything above, so you figure out day one that you start your project area, that first hundred dollars will continue to be set, split the way you would anywhere else in the state. Anything above that is called tax increment, so the incremental increase we're allowed to then capture a larger share of that. We still pass through a portion of it to the schools, to the county, to the city, but the larger amount of that we then keep and we're able to reinvest into the project areas. Um, so what we're, for these last remaining projects, the two that we'll talk about today, we're using that tax increment to reinvest into those areas to address blight. That's kind of the legal um, background to how we end up with project areas. 
Um, so as part of these two project areas that we have, oftentimes we've got three project areas which were able to continue after we were dissolved. It's because we have these agreements between a master developer and in the case of Mission Bay. The area was formed, we had a private partner which was uh, the former redevelop uh, the former rail yards out there, owned a bunch of property, wanted to redevelop it. Um, we'll get into a little bit more detail in the background. We have that partnership agreement of what they will do, what we will do, and how we use the money. So that's why we've been able to continue that. Same thing in Transbay. There's kind of this master agreement for what's going to be done there. Because of these, we're able to continue these projects along with Shipyard. Do you have a question? No? Okay, but you raise your hand. Okay, cool. Um, so just short, what we do as our agency is we oversee the redevelopment of these project areas. Um, we use, oversee the finance, kind of that reuse of infrastructure funds to uh, redevelop those areas. Um, we also finance affordable housing. So this project actually that we're in was financed in part by um, our agency when it was the redevelopment agency. We were able to collect some of the redevelopment funds in different areas and invest them to construct this building. Most of our projects, we don't actually develop affordable housing. We partner with nonprofits and provide inf uh, funding through this tax increment. By law, a certain amount of the tax increment, 20%, needs to be reinvested into affordable housing. Um, and then also most of our projects, for example, Mission Bay, 30% of the for, of the housing will be affordable in projects such as this. Yes, sir. So you were saying it, um, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Now, um, sometimes I read a newspaper about how some buildings that are being built uh, are saying, screw that, I'm not having low market rate rentals. So do you, do, does, and just say like they pay what the city wants mm -hmm. to, to opt out of it, does that money go to you? So it's going to depend on where it is. Um, I will talk about the affordable housing in Mission Bay because each of our project areas depends on what the deal was that was cut. So mm -hmm. um, both Mission Bay and Trans Bay have a different affordable housing project. So I'll talk about what we do in Mission Bay. Um, Shane can touch on kind of program there. So it's really going to depend on where it is in the city. So the city has an affordable housing ordinance that applies to any development outside of a redevelopment agency. And so... Um, where does they, that money go? There is, it would go into a fund and then it's used. It depends on the project. Sometimes they're required to do it on site. Sometimes they're required to pay for a standalone project off site. And then depending on the size of the project, they can also pay a fee, and then that goes into a housing fund to be used for other projects. Um, so a lot of times what you'll see in a project like this brings together a variety of different funding sources. Because um, most of these projects, it's not a single source of funds. I mean, these can be anywhere from hundreds of thousands per unit of subsidy coming from a variety of sources. But yeah, if there's an affordable housing fee, typically that is restricted to just be used in affordable housing, but it may differ on exactly how it's used in affordable housing. Thank you. Yes, sir? I just wanted to go back in the beginning uh -huh. you had mentioned what? Yes. Can you kind of describe what that is? Well, I, I think I know what it is, but I, I'd like to hear it in your terms because it's San Francisco. I'm trying to think of an area that would be considered. Well, they consider it from our it, and it, it changed over time, to be fair. When, it, when um, redevelopment started back in the 40s, 50s, blight could include a vacant agricultural land where a city wanted to put in a um, car dealership. Most people would not say that um, a farm is blight because it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do, i.e. grow food. So over time, the law was changed to tighten up that definition so that there weren't these big loopholes. Um, I would have to, so I'll, I'll be honest, I don't know when prior to dissolution, I can't remember exactly what all the different details for the blight is. Typically it would be income or I, can't, I, I can find out and get back to you on that. Um, well, I mean, it would be, be okay if you gave like an example of an area in the city that's blight. I've been here 25 years. Right. So, so I mean, for example, for Mission Bay, when Mission Bay was formed, it they had to make blight findings. Same thing with Trans Bay. So any of our project areas, at the time they were formed, they were able to make that finding of blight. So in the, in the situation in Mission Bay, most likely the findings were made of that you had um, industrial land that was not being utilized. So probably the findings had something to do with just underutilized land that without some, um, some sort of uh, investment would stay kind of that unused 
um, thing. Now, a lot of people disagree on what blight is, so that has been a constant disagreement over the life of redevelopment. Um, what's blight to one person may not be blight to another, and it's not a term that most people want to have applied to their neighborhood. So like, for instance, that building on 15th Admission, that tan building that was there, that was vacant for many, many years, and now it's that you know, they, they were supposed to make it senior housing. Okay. Somehow it got past the senior housing and now is apartments for some odd reason. Um, that would have been considered a place. You know, I don't know the situation there, it's so vacant. Um, I mean, it was it's vacant. vacant. For 15 years. It, it could have been, um, and the, it depends on, I forget how large the area have to be. Occasionally they were able to do a single area, a single site. Typically it was a larger area that they had to make the blight findings. Right now, with dissolution, we're no longer able to create new project areas, so um, we're no longer making findings of blight um, because that tool has been taken away. Yes, sir? I just wanted to give you a quick example. I think from the way I understood it, was historically, Fillmore was considered blighted and they tore down all the new right. and built what they have now. That was the controversy, actually, oh, at yeah. the time. So it's just they learned over time. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, the Fillmore was during a period of, you know, across the, the, across the country, we had urban renewal. Yeah. And yeah. what was urban, it's not just here, you know, I, I lived back in North Carolina and was next door to Durham, and you still have a giant ring around the city that was, what well, they would come in and demo an entire area saying it was blighted. And in that time, blighted was simply that you had lower income people there, very active communities, which nowadays we would not call blight, it's simply not being high income does not make blight. Um, and unfortunately during that period especially, we, we being the people in redevelopment and the urban renewal, did basically blitz out some very active, healthy, if lower income communities. Um, so Fillmore, I will say, is not the proudest type in redevelopment's history. And um, a lot of work was going into to try and recreate that. You're never going to be able to recreate that. Um, it was not just San Francisco at that point. Unfortunately, the 60s, if you look across the entire country, urban renewal was probably, you know, was not probably, it was not, in hindsight, really the best tool. We hope if we, you know, we don't go in and do uh, the demos. That has changed a lot. Uh, we did, there is one project, the last one we use, eminent domain, uh, which is basically the government's ability to go in and force someone to sell up. The last time we used that was at the sixth and <coughs> sixth and oh, mission. What's the old? Um, there's the old, Hugo. huh? The Hugo, the Hugo Hotel, which oh, had yeah. all the furniture, and that was one actually where we got letters from the community thanking us because the owner had left it vacant for 20 years, um, and we had tried time and time again to get them to sell it if they weren't going to do something to do something and kind of improve that area. That was the last time we've used it. We rarely, rarely over the you know last 20 years have used it just because we don't want to do, uh, we didn't want to repeat the same problems that we had back in the 60s. But now I mean, we, no one will hide the fact that the Fillmore and the Western Edition was a, pro, a you know proud time. <coughs> I like to say that we've moved away and tried to going forward not create that same situation. So is it possible so, that she goes through our whole presentation and then he asks questions? Yeah, I just read this forever. Sure. Uh, that's possible. Thank you. Well, we have other things on the agenda, three of them, so we'll never get past the first. Well, we'll just jump into the more. So that was all the boring background history. Um, so I'll going to talk about Mission Bay and then Shane's will touch on the more of the more of the more of the This is a picture of what Mission Bay used to be, a little bit different than what we have now with ATT Park. It's kind of a fun one. Um, this was when it was active in the 50s. What happened in the 50s, though, is this was port property, a lot of rail that was out there serving that waterfront. In the 50s, we changed from rail-based shipping to um, cargo-based shipping. So what happened was the port of, uh, San, uh, port of San Francisco didn't keep up with the technology. We moved from trains to trucks. The port of Oakland, where you go over there and you see all the stacks of all the, um, those trailers, that's where it moved. So basically everything along the waterfront started going into decline. Um, and so by the time, so when we hit 1996, the plan that we have now, which is this, so the yellow to the north is um, residential with retail. The center blue is UCSF. 
And then the red surrounding is um, private commercial office biotech. Though, in the very bottom below the uh, blue is where UCSF is purchasing land and they just opened a new hospital. So that actually blue has.